Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Tim Ellison. Uh, I'm a senior medical writer at Pharmagenesis London, so the London branch of uh, Oxford Pharmagenesis. And I'm going to be talking today on behalf of my co-authors on some research that we published in BMJ Open earlier this year on a cross-sectional cross study of the open access policies of leading medical journals. So as I said, the article was published in BMJ Open uh, and it was in June this year. Um, the authors were myself, um, Tim Coder, Laura Schmidt, Amy Williams and Chris Winchester, so current and former employees of Oxford Pharmagenesis and Pharmagenesis London. Um, and uh, the objective of the study, or well, the background to the study, was that in general, academic and not-for-profit not research funders are increasingly requiring the research they fund to be published open access, and some insisting on the use of the gold standard CCBY license to allow the broadest possible reuse of those open access articles. And so uh, generally the, the idea behind our research was to clarify the open access variants that are available in leading medical journals, and particularly to clarify whether the the broadest um, license for open access is available for commercially funded research. So I'll start by just listing some disclosures. Um, so this project actually arose um, from Open Pharma, which is a multi-stakeholder project that aims to advance medical publishing by the pharmaceutical industry. And so Open Pharma um, identified a need um, to identify what the leading medical journals open access policies were. Um, but this study was actually funded by Oxford Pharmagenesis. Um, and I'd like to thank um, for their involvement in this study um, some other people. So uh, Robert Kiley, um, who's um, head of open research at the Wellcome Trust. Um, also some other employees of Pharmagenesis um, and two um, kind uh, patient reviewers of our manuscript. So my talk will um, start with an introduction to open access um, and focus on the importance of open access. Um, and then I'll guide you through the methodology results of our study and, and finish with a uh, summary and some conclusions. So starting off with an introduction to open access. So open access is quite difficult to define. Different people have different ideas of what it means, but broadly, open access refers to peer-reviewed full-text research articles that are published um, uh, and available free, uh, free of charge and online. However, there, there is a, a critical part of open access that is sometimes overlooked, um, in that there are, off, there are varying restrictions on reuse of article content uh, um, of open access articles, um, and this is defined by the type of copyright license associated with a published article. So um, some benefits of open access. So um, as you might guess, a free to read um, article encourages more people to download and view that article than a subscription um, uh, model of publishing. Um, also makes sense that they are downloaded more um, and receive more citations, um, which indicates a greater academic impact of that article. Um, they're also more likely to be um, shared um, on social media, um, and which raises their altmetric profile. Um, again, depending on their, uh, the um, copyright license associated with an open access article, they um, can facilitate uh, the reuse of that content, um, either commercially or non-commercially, and that will have a knock-on effect on collaboration, education, and innovation. Um, having um, complete access to a full text of a research article is more transparent than just having um, a paywalled article where you can only access the abstract. Um, and it's important to note as well because um, often academics are particularly interested in getting their research published in high impact journals, which Typically, one might guess that um, they are subscription um, articles that one might have to pay for, but it is important to note that there have been studies to show that there is no difference in the level of quality when, compared, uh, when comparing open access articles to subscription articles. 
So um, important for this talk, um, and important to know in general, uh, is th uh, the specific terminology of a Creative Commons license, which affects the level of reuse um, that a, an open access or a, or a published article can have. So uh, typically, uh, an author, when they publish an article, um, can pay an article processing charge uh, for that article to be available with a Creative Commons license, which allows that article to have certain reuse rights. And there are different types of these licenses available um, that have different levels of reusability. So the gold standard is the Creative Commons Attribution License, the CCBY license, um, which you can see on screen, um, and the, the logo of that on screen. Um, and that um, is, is the most open open access license. It, license. it allows users to um, reuse the content and adapt it, even in a commercial sense, as long as the original work is um, attributed. Um, another example of a Creative Commons license, which is more restrictive, um, would be the CCBY non-commercial license, or the CCBY non-commercial no derivatives license um, is even more restrictive, that restricts um, reuse only for non-commercial work um, and restric restricts the ability to adapt the work. So back to the gold standard CCBY license. Um, it is recommended um, increasingly by uh, non-commercial funders of research, um, including the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's also recommended by a number of different advocates for open access, most notably recently Coalition S, um, have come up with a, a, um, a guidelines, the Plan S guidelines, um, that stipulates that all um, articles should be published open access by 2021. They recommend the CCBY license. So what do journals typically offer? Now, this is obviously the purpose of our, of our research, but generally you can sort of uh, split it into two categories. So you have an option to publish open access with a Creative Commons license that allows reuse. That is typically facilitated by an article processing charge. So following payment of this, um, this charge, um, typically an, uh, an open access article with a, with a Creative Commons license will be available immediately upon publication. It will be in the publisher's typeset format, also known as the version of record, um, and it will be um, available uh, immediately, as I already said. The other option is free to read access, which typically involves an embargo period before it is available um, to the public. Um, and often it's not to the, um, the typeset version of the article, it would be the accepted version of the article that has not yet been typeset um, in, the, in the journal's style. And often it, um, the authors will have to self-archive their work using this option um, on a repository such as PubMed Central. There is an increasing trend towards open access publishing. So in 2015, 50% approximately, 50% of journal articles were published open access. Um, I've already said that um, increasingly, academic and not-for-profit research funders are requiring the research they fund to be published open access. However, um, between 2010 and 2014, 69% of global health research was not freely available on the journal's website. So what about commercial research funders? We talked about non-commercial research funders, but what are they doing? So commercial funders fund approximately half of all medical research, and so are a key funder of, of health research. Um, they anecdotally um, pay for open access when the option is available. We've heard um, from various pharmaceutical companies that they do that. Um, one study has, has shown that between 2009 and 2016, the proportion of uh, articles published by Pharma Open Access doubled. Um, and then, so we're starting to make progress in this area. So at the beginning of 2018, Shire, now part of Takeda, with a, became the first pharmaceutical company to require all of the research manuscripts it funds to be published open access. 
and then at the beginning of 2019, Ipsen also committed to uh, publishing, um, making its scientific research freely available to everyone. So back to our study. So as you recall, we were uh, aiming to clarify the open access variants available um, on leading medical journals' uh, websites, um, and particularly looking at the availability of CCBY for commercial funders. So this is our methodology. We used the Silagent Journal Selector to identify medical journals with a 2015 impact factor of at least 15.0. We then went on to exclude the journals that only publish research, review articles so that we were only focusing on our, um, journals that publish original research. Um, and then we used a manual process of going through their websites and emailing the journals to clarify what the open access variants they have available. So the uh, information that we recorded, so for immediate open access that um, is available upon publication, um, we noted down whether a CCBY license or, create, uh, or a different Creative Commons license was offered. Uh, for delayed open access, we looked at how long the embargo period was before the article became open access or available. Um, and for both of these um, options, we also identified which version of the article was made available. Was it the version of record or was it um, a previous version of the article? Then for the, for the journals that um, said they provided a CCBY license, we also looked at whether uh, the, the requirements for um, being able to um, obtain one of the, those licenses. So for example, was there a dependence on the funding source? Um, and we looked at the charge of the article processing charge. How much does it cost to get one of these licenses? We um, also um, look, uh, used our own sort of um, classification to identify different levels of how open these options were. So as you can see in the table, category one would be the most open option. It's the version of record published immediately we, um, so no embargo period, and that offers a CCBY license. So our results. So we um, identified 53 journals with an impact factor of over 15. We removed um, 16 journals that exclusively published review articles and two journals that weren't um, medical, uh, medical journals. So then we had 35 journals in our analysis. Um, 15 of the journals, we could not find all the information we needed on the website, so we had to email them. 14 out of 15 provided confirmation of, our, um, of, of what we needed. Um, and then we, once we'd tabulated all our results, we contacted all the journals um, to provide confirmation that w we were correct in our findings. And 34 out of 35 of those provided that confirmation. So, we're looking now at the medical journals um, in our analysis, the 35 that came back. 21 of those 35 said that they um, provided the option to publish open access immediately without an embargo period with a CCBY license. And 37% uh, um, had the, um, offered the, as we deemed, least open um, option of an embargo period without a CCBY license. And you can see on the right hand side um, a, a, a bar chart showing that as, you, um, as the journals got um, higher impact, generally um, they were using a uh, less open, open, open access option. This is a pie chart showing the cost of a CCBY license for those that offered a CCBY license. Um, and you can see that uh, the majority of the journals that offer CCBY, um, the article processing charge is $5,000, the maximum amount. Here is a table showing the journals that did not provide an open access option with a Creative Commons license. So you can see in this table, um, a range of different journals, so the, the publishers are on the left hand side, but the, these include multiple uh, different journals, um, offering different um, 
options um, with different um, embargo periods from six to 12 months and generally um, the accepted version of the manuscript rather than the version of record. And here are some examples of some of the um, journals that said they did provide a CCBY license. So again, there's different kinds of options that they offered. Um, but when it comes down to looking at um, offering a CCBY license or a Creative Commons license, if you read the small print, this option is actually only available to non-commercial funders. So I've, uh, we've circled the one journal um, that said that they provided CCBY license for authors where the funder requires it. So that was the only journal where commercial research fund, uh, funders could potentially um, publish open access with a CCBY license. So that's the take home message of our research. So of the journals that um, offer a CCBY license for open access to their journal content, 95% of them only offer that option for non-commercially funded research and, and one journal offered the ability to have a CCBY license if the funder requires it. So summary and conclusions. So the, the take home message is the availability of open access options does depend on the funding source. So as I've said, 95% of journals are only offering, offering the most broad open access license to non-commercial organisations. And that means that they're restricting um, access to medical research funded by commercial funders and the pharma industry. Now, one of our conclusions is that if pharma starts to join the non-commercial funders in requiring open access under a CCBY licence, then the journals would have to start to change their policies or they would have to stop publishing industry research. Um, and as, as a result of this research, Oxford Pharmagenesis reviewed its own position on open access publishing and decided to update its own publication policy to publish its own research with a, CC, with a CCBY license. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>